Welcome back to Sports Will Save Us All. I am your host, Sasha Graham. So a few quick things right here at the top. If you are not already following or subscribing wherever you are listening to this podcast, please do that. We have so many cool things coming up in 2024. So in addition to our incredible guests that we you know, have been featuring for a year and a half, we have added sports movie reviews with my friend Steve, Sports on Screen, which are so fun and funny. You guys are loving those. <clears throat> Excuse me. In addition to that, we are adding a segment. Apparently, you all wanted more of me, which, I mean, who am I to argue with that? So <laughs> we are adding in some short little bites like once a month, you know, topical things that you are interested in, um, getting into the headlines, some of those things that are coming up. So we'll be talking about some of those. So make sure you are following or subscribing wherever you are listening so you don't miss any of those. I sure hope that your new year is starting off well. I am doing so great. Our winter volleyball season kicked off last night. It was pretty cold by Arizona standards, but we played really well, which is never a given after a couple of weeks off. You know, we all had the holidays, we had New Year's, and we got back together like we hadn't missed a beat, which was super fun. It's funny too, because we actually, we won our first two games and then we lost our last one. But the team that we played in that last game was really good. And they were also, like, we could tell they were good people. And so we had a lot of fun during the game. And when, at the end of the game, when we came up short, I think it was 25-20 at the end, we felt like we had played our game and that we had played, we had lost to a really good team. And it was funny how much of a difference that made for us, feeling like we respected the other team and they played well and we played well. It made it sting a lot less, which I don't know why that's always a revelation to me, but it was. So on New Year's Day, I went to the Fiesta Bowl here at the Cardinals Stadium to see the Oregon Ducks just trounce the Liberty Flames. You know, we were hoping that we would have more of a game there. There was a lot of predictions that it would go just like it did. I think Oregon won 45 to 6 or something, but I'm originally from Oregon. So being surrounded by all of those Oregonians, it was just a good reminder of like why sports are so great. You know, that by the end of the by the end of the game, my friend was teasing me that like I was exchanging addresses with everybody in our section to like add them to my Christmas card list. But you know, that's what sports do. You you immediately have this connection with people that you wouldn't normally. A big topic this year has been players opting out of these bowl games. So we were really excited that Bo Nix, who is just the star quarterback of Oregon, that he played in the game. He played just this dynamite game. He's so much fun to watch. And, you know, we were so grateful to get to see him play, but I realized I was sort of of two minds, you know, that if he had gotten horribly injured in this game, there would have been a lot of people saying, you know, well, what were you, what were you doing? And I went back and I watched the press conferences that he gave before the game. And he talked about how it wasn't even a question for him. You know, this is the last chance he was going to get to play with these guys. And, you know, he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to let it pass him up. But, uh, you know, I, I kind of am going back and forth on this. I can see both sides, which is sort of an unusual place to be. I love watching these guys play, but in these bowl games that have really just become exhibition games at this point, you know, when they're not in the playoffs, you know, what's the responsibility there? You know, are they, do they have a responsibility to play for our benefit or would it be better for them to preserve their own bodies and their own careers if they're, if they're planning on going to this next level? So if you feel strongly about this, send me a DM. I would love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Our Instagram is at sports will save us all. And uh, I want to know what you think. So speaking of football, and a guy who I am sure is going to have an opinion on this topic. My guest today was an all-conference cornerback at TCU who went on to be picked up as an undrafted free agent by the Washington Redskins, of course, now the Washington Commanders. Following his release from the team, he taught language arts at an elementary school, which is so cool, went on to coach both Division I and Division II football. In 2013, he opened Performance Experience, where he trains athletes and helps them and their families navigate the athletic scholarship process. Greg Walls, welcome to Sports Will Save Us All. Sasha, Sasha, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Oh, well, Very excited to I'm be so here. I'm so happy you're here. Do you have strong feelings on this, uh, on this thing that's come up this year about players opting out of bowl games? <laughs> Absolutely, but... Uh, I see it from the uh, player perspective is even as a coach or even as a fan, I'm a huge fan, but we 
you know, you have to look out for the preservation of your future. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that um, if you plan to entertain and be a high dollar entertainer, then you have to be capable to do that. And if this game, if there is something, if you're not playing for anything that is going to preserve your future or push you towards your future, then opting out makes economic sense. Is there a world, uh, is there a world where you play so well in that final bowl game that your draft prospects go up? Absolutely. And those are the kids that play. Yeah. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So those kids, it's a, it's an audition. It has to make sense for the individual athlete. And, and, and some of these kids, I don't know if people know, but many of these kids have insurance policies, Mm -hmm. uh, that preserve a little bit of money. If they were to get hurt and they were a high dollar, uh, uh, prospect, uh, but it doesn't amount to what could happen in those sixty minutes for the future of your career. Right. So uh, I think I think that's important to just weigh it according to what makes sense for your future. It, it, it's a weird it's a weird one because I like I said I can I can really see both both sides of that and you know because you know in this case Bo Nix you know I mean he had just this dynamite game and he it was so much fun I mean he is just electric to watch and I was so happy he was there but then you know afterwards I sort of had that feeling god what if he had torn his ACL in that game you know it right oh. so let's look at it from a fan perspective he went out there and he was lights out and mm-hmm. nothing happened and it was all good and his teammates appreciated it and they won the game but did it help him right right I, I- mean I don't know but I don't know how much more help he needs right. to have <laughs> done something to start preparing for uh, the NFL draft. So, you know, it's, it's it, both sides of the street. You just I've learned that you got to approach things with uh, you got to be able to see from both sides. Right. You can't just hold strong to an opinion because of the way it makes you feel. Right. Well, let's talk about your background a little bit because okay. you live in Texas now and you went to Texas yep. Christian, right? But that's not where you grew up? Correct. Correct. I grew up in South Mississippi. I grew up in a small town called Picayune, Mississippi, uh, right on the Louisiana border. I was actually born in California, raised in Mississippi. So I got to Texas by way of Mississippi. And you, did you come from a sporty family? I know that you have a bunch of siblings. I think there's five of you. Is that right? It's five of us. Absolutely. So my dad was a tremendous athlete. Uh, God rest his soul. My dad set records in that town as a long jumper. Uh, He was a great football player. Uh, He coached for years. Little League, you know, our Pee Wee Leagues. He was just tremendous in the community. And uh, I played all three sports. Uh, Played football. I was... I was a much better baseball player, believe it or not. Oh, we're going to talk about that. Football player, but we'll talk about that. Uh, and my sister, uh, she's a all SEC high jumper. Uh, oh, no my brother, kidding. he went to school on a on a on a scholarship before he went to the Air Force. So he, it's a lot of athletics in in our. I Boy, mean, I'd say I, I'm I, in I, athletics today. So you know, it, it's been a part of my life since the beginning of my life. Well, yeah, no, and I, and that really struck me, you know, when I was looking at sort of your CV and everything you, that you've done, I mean, it looks like you started playing baseball when you're about six years old and now, you know, to bring you to now, you're still in sports and that's still the central focus of your life. You yeah. mentioned baseball and you were a two-time All-American baseball player in high school. Yeah. You didn't start playing football actually until what, like eighth grade? Eighth grade. That's eighth correct. grade. Eighth so grade. why, yeah. why was that? My mom said I was too little. She was scared I might get hurt. Uh, <laughs> Mama Bear, so I love it. So this was before CTE and concussions. Uh. And I was, Sasha, I was too small. My mama, she wasn't trying to hear it. Uh, <laughs> my best friends, they played in Pee Wee. I used to cry every year. Like, Mama, why? I go out here and I play in the yard with no equipment, no regard, no age limits. We go out there and we get after it. Of course, she don't know about that. But when it comes to <laughs> organized football, my baby's too little. So my dad, he would fight for me all the time. We mm-hmm. would, but that's a match. We just couldn't win. So uh, eighth grade, middle school, they knew I was going to play in high school. So they had to let me play. So eighth grade was when I started playing organized football. 
And so you, before that, before eighth grade, because now we're seeing, you know, these kids start peewee football and, you know, there's this, of course, has become really controversial because of the CTE that you mentioned. You know, we're starting to learn that starting that young is really not good for our brains. But but so many of these kids are- We're going to talk about that. I'm going to disagree with you and I'll tell you why, but continue. Okay. So, so the idea of these kids starting to specialize at these really young ages, that wasn't what you did. I mean, you played- like you said, you played all of these sports, but not football until eighth grade. And yet then you had this incredible career. Do you think that benefited you playing these different sports prior to that? 1,000%. Yeah. I, I, think, I think there's an order and I'll explain that. So let me uh, first, we'll talk about two parts. I'm going to answer where I interjected. Sure. Um, I think you should start whatever you start as early as you can comprehend what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I believe that. It's almost like when you start making sounds to writing letters, from letters to words, from words to sentences. Here's the language arts teacher in you. (laughs) The better you'll be regardless of how old you are. Mm -hmm. So if we teach kids how to play football, not how to play quarterback, not how to play cornerback, not how to play running back, but how to play football, how to develop your movements at a, at a little, at a young age. So understanding the concept, mm-hmm. how to tackle at a young age, because there are multiple ways to teach proper tackling without hard contact, banging your head again, because you t- they took, they took your head out of tackling anyway. So you need to learn as early as possible. So I'm saying to answer that, yes, they should start early. It helps the development, not the banging or the actual contact, because nothing helps blunt force trauma. Right, right. However, it's it's interesting that that idea of laying down those tracks really early, because absolutely. it's like language development. You know, if you're if you're teaching your kid two languages when they're two years old and they're doing language acquisition, the chances of them, you know, retaining those those languages are much much higher than if you start teaching them when they're you know in high school. So yeah. let me give you a real example. Uh, Arch Manning, I'm sure you've mm-hmm. heard of Arch Manning. Who is, who is his people? The Mannings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Peyton. Yeah, Eli. yeah, yeah. Eli, yeah. Now, Peyton and Eli, both Hall of Famers, tremendous careers. But what I try to help people understand is the reason, because of that, Daddy Archie. Archie taught them how to throw a ball as soon as he puts the ball in their hand. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have any bad habits. They did not understand what they were doing when they started. They weren't just playing and breaking bad habits. They started with fundamental Mm -hmm. and look where it took them. That's what, that's what they knew how to do. That's in everything. So if we teach these kids, like you said earlier, not specialization of the quarterback position Mm -hmm. or to pitch, I gotta teach you how to throw. I gotta teach you how to be balanced. I gotta teach you how to run. I gotta teach you how to squat. Once you learn those things, and if I can teach you that in first grade, second grade, third grade, and you start getting the concept of the sport that you're in in second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, by the time you're eighth grade, you have 10,000 reps. So by the time you're a senior, that's why these kids look so amazing Mm -hmm. and they're so developed and they're so enhanced because they're starting development early they're not just playing they're learning how to move we played and learned how to play they're learning how the game is played so do you feel like that worked against you then not it, learning that so early i mean because your career was incredible <laughs> well i got my reps a different way so i loved playing so once I learned how to do something, I just went and did it. Mm-hmm. For example, for baseball, like I hit off the tee because I love baseball. Like nobody had to come tell me. So I got a lot of extra reps. We had great coaches in Little League. So I was learning. So when I was 10, I could hit a fastball. I could hit a curve. I knew how to hit. I knew how to approach it. When I was 16, 17, all I hit was fastballs because that's all I wanted to hit. But there are kids that are 12 and 13 that are much better than I was at 15, 16. Mm-hmm. Not because they started playing early. It's because they learned how to play. 
there are some very skilled, gifted instructors in today's world, online and in person, teaching these kids science of what they're doing, mm -hmm. the kinesiology of what they're doing, the development of what they're doing. They're not just out there, dads aren't doing it. Not that dads don't know what to do. Moms, it's just moms aren't doing you it. Have professionals, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you have professionals who are teaching these kids how to do what they're planning to do as they go and uh, compete. And I, I, th I think it's fantastic. You mentioned, really you mentioned your coaches and your little league coaches as a, as a youth baseball player being really great. What made them great? Well, my, the coaches I had, uh, I played a lot of rec ball. We didn't play a lot of select ball, played a lot of rec ball, but I had some of the most high level coaches, um, on earth and they were all local dads and the, what made them great was they cared the passion they had for the game and the passion they had for us. That's what made them great. Hmm. And that's just the truth. They, yeah. they instilled things in us that I take with me today. Hmm. Now, the best coach I've ever had is Chris Thurman. Chris Thurman, who is now with uh, shout out to coach Chris Thurman, who was at, Oklahoma State as a defensive analyst. He's a tremendous human being. And what made him great was not just his football prowess and what he taught us at that position, but he treated us like men. Mm -hmm. Like He treated young men like men. And to me, that was all you could ask for as a 8, 17, 18, 19-year-old country boy coming from Mississippi to Texas to go do this football thing for four years. So it, it, he, he's, he's the best. When you say he treated you like men, do you mean that he had high expectations for you? Well, he, he set standards that we could all, that we all agreed to in the mm -hmm. room. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was ultimate respect that we had for him and that he had for us. And then he made sure we understood that, you know, through the hierarchy, although, you know, his title is above ours, as a person, he's not above us. Mm. You know, we could talk to him. We could relate to him. Uh, he coached us hard. Like, he pushed us. He, he demanded from us. But he respected us. And he, 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 there were standards as men that you just, you, you have to appreciate. I talk to him all the time still. Do like, you really? This was, yeah, I talked to Coach Thurman last week. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> that's so cool. Like a lifelong collect connection. Yeah, because of the way he treated us. Yeah. You know, he treated us like men. So we acted like men. Yeah. I, I think. I think that's what made him great. So I mentioned that you were just an extraordinary baseball player in high school. Why didn't you play baseball in college? Ah, that's, that's, that's <laughs> a so here's what happened. So I was being recruited uh, by TCU football. I got the, the scholarship in football. Um, but Coach Watson at the time, who was there, and Coach Brown, they were the baseball coaches. And they said I would be able to play. Like I could come during like when football season was over and go play baseball. Um, so that I was sold. You know, I'm D1. We're going into a new program. Incredible. I can do what I love. But our coaching staff got fired. The baseball my, coaching staff? No, the football coaching oh, staff. Oh, gotcha. That's, so it's a weird story. So the football coaching staff got fired after my freshman year. So Coach Fran and his staff, well, Coach Thurman and those guys came in. Coach Fran was the head coach. And he told me, yeah, you can play, you can play baseball, but you can't miss football playing baseball. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to be a spring, spring ball, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, it would have been my first year, so I wasn't going to be able to – I wasn't – I'm smart enough to know – I'm not going to try to split that as a freshman with a brand new coaching staff. I got a spot to earn when my money is made. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, you know, once I get this thing figured out, I'll go back and play baseball. Yeah. Well, I got it figured out. I just didn't go back and play baseball. Right. Now, here's the extended part of that story. I played all four years in football. I played as a freshman. So I had a fifth year of athletic eligibility. I was done with football, so I went and talked to Coach Watson and Coach Brown. I said, hey, Coach, man, they, I'm available. I went out, and I played throughout the spring. That was the first time I picked up a 
a ball or a bat in four years. You played. And I had a tremendous spring. You like played I had TCU a, football or uh, baseball your senior year? I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. <laughs> I, I was practicing. I was a part of the team. I was out there. But my degree is in education. And I only had eight weeks of school left. So I would have had to enroll in school in full time to be able to play. And then I had to pay for that. Right. And I just wasn't going to do that. Right. Yeah. You're like, I like <laughs> I baseball, but I'm not sure if I like it. That, yeah. And I had, <laughs> yeah, I was, I had just been cut from football. I had that a little bit of time. I was still trying to get back in football. It was a lot going on at right. that time. But um, the Yankees came out and they said, uh, you know, we remember you. Uh, we can't draft you, you too old, brother. Uh, but we'll give you a look, and if you complete the season, then uh, we'll we'll give you a look at bringing on as a free agent. But I didn't even go and put the season. The Yankees. So, yeah. <laughs> it was a cool day. It was that that was the conversation. That is a wild, wild story. Yeah. Let's go back in time just a little bit and talk about you playing cornerback for TCU because okay. you know we talked about this off mic a little bit, which is that you know cornerbacks for anybody who doesn't know you know they are defensive backs and they cover the wide receivers right so it is the most I think athletic position on the field you have to be fast you have to be you have to be able to pivot you have like all of these things jumping but then also you have to be smart because you have to be able to anticipate what's going to happen with that play and you know it occurred to me that it's a position that if you're doing your job really well, they're just not throwing to that guy, right? <laughs> <That's> so, <correct>. <laughs> <laughs> so it's sort of a position that's proven by its negative. You know, if if your receiver is not getting any passes thrown to them, it's because you're doing a really good job. Which that seems um, a little bit thankless to me. Is that ever how it felt? No, it actually. Um, you understand the assignment when you're on that island, mm -hmm. like so it. You have to take some some things with you. You have to have an uh, overwhelming sense of confidence that's actually probably delusional. <laughs> like, it's a fine to, line. <laughs> yeah, it really is. You have to really believe certain things. And that belief comes with preparation, in my opinion. It's easy to believe things if you're just out there talking and not doing. But yes, you have to be athletic. You have to be really athletic. And you have to, your reaction, your handout coordination has to be there. But more important, you got to have eye discipline. You have to believe what you see and react to what you see, mm. but see the right thing. And when you got best, the best eye discipline, the most confidence, and then if you work on those athletic skills, man, that, that job, it can get a little boring out there. <laughs> so you got to keep it exciting. <laughs> but if it's too exciting... That means uh, they're running up the score on you and you need to do a better <laughs> job. <about that. laughs> well, it's interesting that you say that about, you know, it being boring out there because it seems like that would yeah. be a really, really um, effective way to wear down a cornerback's awareness. You know, that if you're if you're getting bored out there, it seems like you're um, you wouldn't be as alert and ready to defend as you should be. Well, then that, that's what, that's where that confidence and that aggression comes from. That's where you have to turn the game up yourself. Uh, because a lot of, a lot of times at that spot, you know, your play is a big play. You get 50, 50 balls, you get balls downfield. When the ball goes up, you know, it's three things that can happen. You, they either catch it, they don't catch it or you catch it. Mm -hmm. In between that, you got pass. That's an offense. You got holding, you know, you got double moves. You got to run up and make tackles. There's a lot of things, but our discipline is, is a thing. And then you got to be a good athlete. There aren't, if, if you're not a really good athlete, you're not going to be able to play that position, period. No matter how smart you are, uh, no matter how big you are, if you can't move and open them hips and put your foot in the ground and come forward or backwards, I'm sorry, it's going to be a long day for you. <laughs> yeah, it's not a position that I would like to play, I don't think. <laughs> so you then were, you were picked up as an undrafted free agent after TCU. Yes. And I have heard you talk about this because you spent the preseason with them and then you were released from the team. And I've heard you talk about this failure being the first time that you had experienced failure. Yeah, if it's anything I try to teach, uh, 
let me say it better. If there's anything I've learned that I think is important for young people to learn, uh, it's experiencing failure as early as possible. Because, yeah, that was the first time I had failed at anything, Sasha. And, and I'm not saying that, like, I'm the best at everything. I'm saying whatever I had done up to that point, it was successful. All mm-hmm. conference, all state, all American in baseball, honor roll, honor society, scholarship, four-year start. Like I had Dream scenario. Yeah. Told, yeah. Yeah. I had never been told you can't do that. Right. That, and not not you can't do it as motivation. That's the end. You're done. You need to figure out how to go do it. And what I mean by that is when I got cut, that wasn't the failure. That was the end of that. I didn't control that stop date. That's what made it a failure. When I got cut, I hadn't played football since. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That wasn't by my own choice. Right. I think I would have better handled three or four years of transition had I failed at 12. Yeah. Yeah. You know, had I failed at 15, something like that. I mean, everything's harder when we're adults, right? <laughs> oh, it's so terrible. I mean, because you go back to an age of un- lack of understanding. And un- when you fail, you feel like a failure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a terrible feeling. So, mm-hmm. and, and we need, I think we need to talk about that. Like, like that, that, that's a real gut headache. That's a real feeling because physically there's nothing you can do. And as an athlete, you make your way by all the things you do physically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You run, you jump, you hit home runs, you match ball at the sky, you strike people out, you make jump shots. So people see your ability. You know, they don't see your work. Like I can write a book and they can see my work, but they don't see the ability to write a book. In, athlete, in athletics, they see what you're capable of. So physically, you prepare for that. Right. What happens when they say you're done and now the physical preparation is for not? Because I went to tryouts. I tried out for Canadian teams. I tried out for more NFL teams. I made calls. I had friends making calls. That just wasn't it. And I knew I was good enough to get there. Mm-hmm. Because I was there. Yeah. I knew I was good enough to compete. Evidently, I wasn't good enough to play. That's the way I took it. Because that's the way it is. What, what do you think the issue was there? There specifically mm-hmm. or overall? Well, uh, I can tell you. Both, I, I think. you both scenarios. Yeah. When I was with the former Redskins, now Commanders, the issue was I wasn't good enough to make that team. Listen, they kept, I think, five – well, I'll name them. Daryl Green, who is a Hall of Famer. Mm-hmm. Champ Bailey, who is a, a Hall of Famer. Fred Smoot, who they <laughs> drafted in the second round that year. And Donovan Greer, who they picked up, uh, I think, in a trade. or And he was one of the fastest people on the team. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't going to make that team. Now – Everybody hearing me say that, or if they saw that roster, it's easy now to go online. You ain't going to make that team anyway, but boom, boom, boom. But let's look at it. I didn't think I wasn't going to make that team. <laughs> Why would I think I'm not going to make right. that team? Why would I believe I'm not good enough to go out there and do? Because I'm right there with them. I'm competing. Why? That's that confidence. Mm-hmm. That's that. Now, we can say, well, only this amount of people make it to the NFL. Well, I'm here. I'm standing <laughs> right here next to Bruce Smith and Sam Shade. Like, I'm standing next to these guys. So why would I believe for one minute I'm not good enough? Well, not to mention your whole life you had been exceeding exactly. everybody else. I mean, in everybody's, you know, abilities. So, I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. If you've always been in a position where you are at the top of the heap, why wouldn't you think you were going to continue being at the top of the heap? So if I would have had the opportunities and like the way these kids are navigating these processes now, I never would have went to the Redskins. I would have went to the Cowboys. Mm. I'll tell you why. Because they didn't have those names on that roster that year. And they called and they wanted me in camp. And they brought in a heap of defensive backs at corner and safety. 
that's what they needed at the time. Had I had a little bit of understanding and a little bit better insight and a little bit of knowledge going into that. Not, not people can say, yeah, you're supposed to have an agent. And I did have an agent and all the other cool stuff. But, you know, that, that was a three-month process or a two-month process. Mm-hmm. So had I done that, I'd have made a different decision that would have took me on a different path that I may not have said. Or maybe I would have. Right. Because here's the thing. I didn't make another team and I didn't go play anywhere else. Mm-hmm. See what I'm saying? I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Life is funny that way. You know, you, yeah. you end up and, and now here we are. Tell me about your experience opening this business, performance experience. Why did you do it? What is your goal for the business? Who do you work with? Tell me everything. Okay, so performance experience was in thought for five years. It was a plan five years before it even came to this. So it was something that I had an understanding of. I understand how important scholarship opportunities are and they were. It's different now because of NIL deals and the game has expanded and now the game is worldwide. But when I was coming up, um, it was it was localized. Mm-hmm. And to be found was a little bit of a chore. Uh, now it's the click of a link. So it's different. So what I realized is that my opportunities, I learned so much about the process. I learned about the development process, the training process, the recruiting process. I had to recruit kids and give kids scholarships and, and recruit on the road. And when you were coaching. They, yeah. Yeah. All the things they needed to know. So I'm, I understand itineraries and the business of camps and combine. So I, I understood all of these things. So I started developing a plan for it. Sports season, so we put these developmental programs, speed program, skill program, or personal training. We can do these things and house this all under one roof. Mm-hmm. So that's that was the thought process for performance experience. When we started, we were adult fitness and sports performance. So we can train the parents while the kids go work on their development. Mm, smart. Uh, and it has grown like that, but now we have taken taken a much more uh, development, skill, process, athletic approach in all sports. Mm-hmm. All sports, Sasha. We work. We have three different programs, and these programs have been around since we've been around. We have a youth development program that we've been running for years. Actually, it's our speed program has won awards over the past couple of uh, years. So we have one for kids between the ages of 8 and 12. We call it Speed Stars. You know, I I have a question about this because I was was pretty fast growing up, and one of the things that my basketball coach would always say to me was, you can't teach speed. And I went on your website, and your website says, oh, yes, we can. (laughs) Talk to me about teaching. Talk to me about teaching speed. Okay, so God gives you the ability to be fast, right? God, God, that's up to God how fast you are. But speed is developed. If I can fix your engine and I can make sure your wheels are aligned, I can measure <laughs> how much faster you'll be from the time that uh, I saw you from the time that we finished. It's like, what's the difference between a six-cylinder and a four-cylinder? Two cylinders, <laughs> which maximizes a whole bunch of power. Uh-huh. And you can teach power. But here's why. If we can align your body, teach you how to move, and put the structure in place and show you how power, where your power is and how powerful you can be through your hips, bottom of your feet, shoulders, understanding how to snap, drive, dorsiflex, all of those, that's teaching. Mm-hmm. All of those elements, if I can teach you how to move like that, once you start running, those movements are what makes you fast. Right. I tell them all the time, Sasha, the less you do, the more you get. <laughs> I've never seen a person behind the wheel of a Cadillac gripping the steering wheel and shaking it back and forth <laughs> as hard and as fast as they can to make the car go faster. 
<laughs> it's it's so funny. We uh, I mentioned at the top that I play beach volleyball and we play power fours. And it's very funny because sometimes we will play against teams that just are so good that they're not moving, you know, that they just know their position so well that their energy output, it just looks like nothing. And yet they're beating us where we're flying all over the court. We're diving for balls and we're, you know, sweating. And, and these people look like they're, you know, just out for a Sunday stroll. So that's what I'm picturing. You know, if you're, if you're really good at your craft and at what you're doing at your sport, that it becomes a lot easier. <laughs> the movements are fluid, mm-hmm. you become water. That's real, but yep. you got to learn how to do that. I didn't learn how to run until after I needed to know, mm-hmm. until after the pro day at uh, TCU, until after I got cut. I didn't learn how to run properly. And I'll tell you who taught me. It was a strength and conditioning coach, and it was a personal trainer who taught speed. This was they, so you they, didn't uh, learn how properly to run until after TCU. It surprises me that they after. didn't have someone there teaching you to do that. Well, here's the thing: we had a strength and conditioning coach, like we the, we had all of those pieces, but their job they can't individually teach me how to run. They got to run a team and they got to run groups, and so that's not their. That, that's why in college and in high school. You don't get that because that's not their job. Mm-hmm. That's why I have a job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's you can really focus in, take a look. Yeah, that, that's the job. Mm-hmm. You know, so they taught me about Dorsey Flex and how to drive and be powerful through the floor, and I learned that and how my shoulder movement and my output and exhale. So when I learned it, I said, you know what? I don't want people to know too late. So mm-hmm. if I can teach you at a young age, I can teach. I can get you ready. Right. When it's time to be ready. I can't teach you. If the college professor says you have a dissertation, I, in six weeks, nobody has time to teach you how to write sentences. Mm-hmm. Nobody has time to teach you how to write a sentence. Because by the time you learn, the dissertation is over and you made a zero. Right. But if you learn how to write sentences in third grade, you understand what a dissertation is. Do they have fun, these kids? They have a blast. They have a blast. <laughs> it's fun. The music is always playing. I make sure our coaches at uh, Speed Stars, and I mean this, make it fun for those young kids. So we developed that program with some teaching, some competition, some games, and then we wrap it up. But it's a lot of energy. Like I said, we treat it. We know the audiences that we're appealing to. A lot more intense with the middle school and the high school kids, sure. but it's fun. It's music is playing. They know what they're competing for. That's what I like to Coach hear. Is fantastic. It's, it's amazing. That, it's that's amazing. what I like to hear. I feel like so much of that, you know, we forget that the reason why we do this, the reason why we play sports Absolutely. is, is for the connection and the community and for the fun and for, you know, Absolutely. really seeing what our bodies can do. And that, that makes me happy. Let me ask you a question. Why did you name your podcast. Why is why that title? Because I think that title is tremendous and I believe. What does it mean to you? Tell me this. Well, for me, because I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about this ever since, you know, we we first connected. For me, it is sports and teams is one of the few places where it is truly the the game will always be bigger than the end. Mm-hmm. Period. Yep. Second thing is the standards of success in every sport are always high and always fundamental. Always. Can't quit. Got to have some sort of integrity. You got to communicate. No good team doesn't communicate. Mm-hmm. I'm taking all of these lessons into my business into my conversations with these kids, into my relationships, because you have to, you know what I, you know what taught me the importance of being on time? Sports, yep. football, not, not work, not school, not, not my parents. Now they, they reiterated it and they enhanced it, but every good coach I ever had you better be on time. Not just that saying, if you're on time, you're late. No, 15 minutes early, 
ready to go. Mm -hmm. You'll never know what might happen. You better be there. We will start without you, and you will be punished for it. You know why? Because your teammates are relying on you. Yeah, there's a lot of accountability that comes with sports. That's for sure. (laughs) So much accountability. And you see people run away from Mm you. You know who you can count on in your team. Yep. You know it. Mm -hmm. You watch them play. Mm -hmm. You know who talks in the pregame, but who does in the game. Mm -hmm. You know. You know the level of competition. You get scout reports. You know what you're up against. Sports taught me how to study. Mm Mm-hmm. Not school. I didn't, school wasn't that difficult for me, mm-hmm. you know. But sports taught me I got to watch this and I got to know what I'm looking at. Oh, I'm going to get cooked this week. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very motivating, noise. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Like, so, and then it teaches you how to deal with things in the moment. Mm-hmm. At corner, you could be for a touchdown. You better let that go. And you got to really let it go. And, like, once they finish their celebration and they kick the extra point, and you go back on defense, you got to be ready to go or else everybody will see it all mm-hmm. night long. Yep. Those are the lessons that I learned. I learned that. Yep. It taught me not to quit. One of the biggest compliments that I've ever received is based on my persistence. And you're very persistent. I learned that sports. I think there's a lot of things in sports that we get – immediate or fairly immediate payoff that then we can take to our lives in general. You know, that being accountable, you know, learning those time management skills, learning how to study, all of those things, you know, with with sports, when you learn your plays in basketball, or if you don't know your plays in basketball, you know, it becomes really obvious really fast, right? It's it, You can't skate through that. If you're not where you're supposed to be, then everybody can see it. And, you know, so I think that you, that it's, you know, it's one more great thing. It's one more great thing about sports. Sports fam, if you are interested in learning more about Greg and performance experience, you can find his business online at pesportsandrec.com and on Instagram at performance experience. You can follow Sports Will Save Us All, of course, on Instagram at Sports Will Save Us All, where you can see all sorts of shenanigans happening. If you are not already following the show, like I mentioned on your favorite podcast platform, make sure you do that so you're notified every single week when a new show posts Thanks, as always, for listening and reviewing and for sharing the show with your friends. And remember, we are always looking for great sports stories. So if you know someone we should talk to, send us an email at sportswillsaveusall at gmail.com. Sports Will Save Us All is part of the Tiny Ninja Network. You can find us online at sportswillsaveusall.com. That is it for me today. I will see you next week with more stories about how sports will save us all. (laughs) 